Hi, Donovan. Thanks for joining us. Hi, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. No worries. And do you want to just start off by just telling us a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up and how you got into sim racing? So my name is Donovan. I'm the owner of World of Racing. And I grew up in the Netherlands. Uh, I was actually born in New Zealand, but my parents kidnapped me to the Netherlands when I was 18 months old. <laughs> uh, lived there until I was 21. Uh, moved to LA. Started riding motorcycles in LA. And you know, ever since I grew up, I loved Formula One. Started watching Formula One you know, when I was 12 or 13. Um, really followed it until I kind of moved to the United States. And then kind of lost touch with it for a few years because it's kind of hard to watch have one uh, in the US and then in you know, the last few years they made it a lot more accessible got back into it and kind of from motorcycling accidentally rolled into sim racing what is like the the interest in cars and like the F1 like you kind of like you're into the speed dynamics or like the competitive nature of it what was it that kind of drew you towards that I think it was a combination of both oddly enough the speed doesn't do much for me um you know it is really more of competitiveness and just the constant pursuit of improvement yeah i mean there's always something to learn um uh, just from basic driving techniques to way more complicated setup uh configurations you can do you know it just it's always a interesting uh, puzzle to me and okay. then doing new tracks new cars i mean yeah it's just a lot of fun that way like I'm not an expert on sim racing, but what is like the history of it? Like how long has it been around for and like how has the technology improved over the years? I started playing racing games all the way back to the uh, you know, Atari with pole position. Um, yeah, I think the first proper, you know, almost sim was a Grand Prix on the Amiga and you know, PC back in the early 90s. And I spent countless hours of that. Um, obviously, this was before the internet came along. So it was just, at the best, like a local network. But very often, you know, I had friends come over and we would just all do different qualifying laps. And you know, the computer would take turns uh, driving for the other person uh, while the other person was racing. So we had whole tournaments that way. Um, you know, racing games have always been very popular. Yeah. Then, yeah. You know, Really, I think kind of sim racing was put on the map. You know, right now, obviously, with Gran Turismo, it's very the movie Gran Turismo just was released. That kind of put sim racing on the map in terms of you know the Nissan GT Academy actually doing a competition on the PlayStation and having contestants drive in real life and then putting a real well, putting a person into a real you know GT car uh, at Le Mans and. Um, I think that sparked a lot of interest, and then you know, iRacing came out in 2008, um, which was online racing. And since then, the technology has advanced more and more and more to where now, with motion and direct drives, it's a real you know, uh, immersive experience that has all the you know, real physics as well. So, uh, what you can do in sim racing translates directly to real life racing. Yeah, it's good timing with the uh, Gran Turismo movie and your your business. So I'm sure there's a lot of people that see that movie and will be like, I want to try this. Yeah, so, well, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> so how, what other kind of games like was there like early on, like in terms of like, was it PlayStation that kind of really got the masses involved in like car racing games? Yeah, I mean, the Gran Turismo was huge. Um, you know, Forza, of course, on the, place, on the Xbox. Yeah, you know, it's very popular. Um, you know, there is a big difference between the consoles and the PCs. Um, and when I said I kind of rolled into sim racing, uh, you know, I, you know, I was a huge racing gamer growing up, kind of moved on from it. And then last year, I kind of discovered how amazing these games are uh, <laughs> these days. And you know, people can create you know, their own kind of laser scan tracks almost with LiDAR data, you know, with government data, and they put these whole tracks together that are very close to real life. Which you know, allows people to you know, practice here, how practice at a sim before going out in real life. Uh, I think that there's a million racing games, so it's hard to kind of pinpoint one of them. Uh, you know, for rally, there was Richard Burns, uh, but like back in the PlayStation, it was you know Fee Rally and Colin McRae Rally, right? Uh, it just 
yeah, I, I think about 10, 15 years ago, PCs got powerful enough to really mimic the necessary physics for at home sim racing. You know, obviously, the sim races, uh, the sims that they have at a Formula One facility are a whole level above this. But yeah, you, you can buy a decent PC off the shelves and be sim racing an hour later. What about like the first kind of steering wheel and like pedals, like those kind of systems? When did that first kind of start? I think pretty early on. I mean, I, I remember having one, you know, back uh, in the 90s when I uh, did it. Uh, now, back then, it was very much just a auto way to be a very basic controller. You might get some vibration on the PlayStation with the vibration controllers. But that was that was kind of it. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to feel the curbing. You wouldn't be able to feel the 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 tires slipping, tires having less grip, uh, those things. And so that over you know the last 10, 15 years, the direct drives has become a whole different game, really. Um, and it's hard to really explain unless you experience it. But it's like yeah, when you go to an arcade, right, and you go to like a racing game there and yeah, the wheel just spins right there's nothing there's no force that makes the wheel turn the other way you know it's, it's just it's just fun whereas with these wheels that you have that we have here yeah it, it just feels you, you're racing a car i mean people are exhausted typically when they've done it for an hour or two uh, because it's a real physical exercise to muscle the car around right so like the you, you're talking about direct drive like the steering wheel will like fight back it's going to be very like hard to steer like what kind of, what kind of equipment do you have there and like how does it kind of work a direct drive wheel could be hard to turn but then you kind of probably have it set up wrong uh it, it shouldn't be set up where it's so hard that you really have to force it right it should be that you have you have to put some force into it so you can feel the grip and most importantly you know that the wheel gets light when you lose grip but if you have to really muscle it around then you actually lose the detail that you need to translate the movement of the car like in real life, we have G-forces. You know, now, you know, obviously, motion helps a lot, but the wheel gives you a lot of information what's happening with the car. So you need to be able to tune it where it has enough force where you have to put you know, some effort into it, but not enough where you know, you're fighting the wheel. Because if you do that, when the car then starts to slide, right, you, you can't catch it because then it just spins around. And if you're not careful, you might actually break your hands. Um, now there's that much force in them. Uh, and that's really the most dangerous part of sim racing is when your force feedback is too high and somebody t-bones you or something and the wheel just gets flung out of your your, your hands uh it, it can be dangerous so you know the things we have at the sim racing center here world of racing we have fan attack dd2s the semi cube two pros so really kind of top of the line you know direct drive systems um but they're tuned you know, for everyday use so they're not at 100 percent because that's not necessary um but by having kind of the top of the line you do get a finer level of detail which you know, just adds to the experience and they're kind of like i don't know sure what you call them but like they're like 4d like experience where the the seat moves up and down and back and forth and like how does that work so it's really quite amazing with what i think you know, the games send back as telemetry data you know, it's it very much mimics real life data you get from a car or a motorcycle so all those movements just get translated into the motion system and the motion systems are magnetic actuators so again it's a lot of detail it's not like a dog system that you know uh would kind of struggle to keep up but with the magnetic actuators it you know, i think it has 900 uh movements a second uh so it's, it's a lot of different things it can tell you and then having four actuators, of course, translates directly to the four wheels. You know, on the four D or four DOF platform, you know, you can also have the traction loss. So when the car slips out, you can really you know feel the rear sliding, or when you hit the brakes and the rear starts getting loose, you can really feel those movements. You know, we had a very experienced racing driver here yesterday that's been racing cars for you know six decades. You know, uh, going all the way back to co-parting in the Netherlands to racing cars in the Nordschleife, uh, and and he was amazed like how realistic it felt. Going back to the Gran Turismo movie, like is is that realistic to be able to like use these simulators and then go off and race real cars? Like, because the the technology is so realistic nowadays that it kind of translates over. Yes, absolutely. Um, everything you know, you see a lot of people that done sim racing and they go to the track for the first time and they are doing much better than people that 
don't have any experience uh, sim racing. If you have the right setup, like the right pedals, the right wheel, the kind of things, um, you know, everything you do in sim racing translates almost one on one to the track. So racing line, braking technique, steering angle, throttle control, all these things are one on one. Obviously, in real life, you have the G forces, and if you go off the track, it costs money. But yeah, there's a reason I think why Max Verstappen is killing it in Formula One because you know, all he does in his free time is sim racing, right? So he just he keeps holding that skill, and you know, as a result, he's so much faster than everybody else. It's also expensive to crash a car, but it's also you know life threatening. Like they can die, so doing it in the sim is you don't have that risk. Yeah, uh, and we had a professional driver here the other day, and I'll leave out the details, but. Uh, he went to a pretty a big support race for one of the, the premier series and he was here he practiced for six hours for the weekend never been to the track before and went there and won right so it did really helped him to learn the track behavior of the car obviously the guy's immensely talented don't get me wrong right it's not all because you're in sim racing but it's definitely a, another tool in the arsenal people can use Part of the reasons why we launched world of racing was to make racing more accessible to people and racing is very expensive even Go-karting for kids is, you know, ridiculously expensive. Yeah, you know, with race weekends between five hundred and a thousand dollars, you know, um, very easily, if not more. On top of it, it's a time investment getting to a track. I mean, we're based in LA, so the closest track is at least an hour away. You know, whereas with sim racing, you know, you can just hop down the street now and hop on here and do one or two hours of practice and learn the same techniques at a fraction of the cost. So when you do go to the track, you just you know, much better prepared. And in terms of cost, like I'm sure these machines are very expensive. So in terms of getting it for your house, like it's probably better off just coming to you because you've got it all set up and it's ready to go. Yeah, I'm biased, of course, <laughs> uh, but that is part of the idea, right? I mean, for most people putting something in your house, I mean, you know, if you have the money, sure, but it takes up a lot of space, a lot of maintenance, a lot of you know, time to just get it up and running every time. And even if you have one, you know, then the best you can do is kind of race online or race against AI. You know, where it's really fun is to be able to come in with a group of friends and race against each other or even a group of strangers sometimes. But you know, the real life racing is what makes it a lot of fun. And you know, very few people have the room or the money to put multiple at their house, right? Uh, it's just not really practical. And you know, they run into tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, so it is much more you know, cheaper to come here. <laughs> Uh, it's a much better investment, I think. About the same price as a, a cheap car. Uh, yeah, you, you can buy you know, a, a pretty nice car. Uh, <laughs> some of the stuff here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you have any like professional races or like up and coming people that are coming to you to kind of learn? Yeah, I, I won't mention their name because I haven't got a you know, clearance for that. But uh, we, we have quite a few professional racers. You know, my son just started go karting this year, and, and, and he's killing it. Uh, and you know, really partially because of the sim, uh, you know, he's able to figure out tracks and different conditions much easier because he's always there. But we have yeah people that go to professionally come here very regularly, join our race nights. So it's been a really fun group of mix of people that come here. We have everything from like you know, three generations that want to race together to the professional racer, to these hardcore you know, car fans, to date nights. So it really is run the gamut. People love racing, right? And this just gives them a whole new avenue to do so. And what kind of like games do you have? Are there different games with different tracks and different cars or? So we only want one game, which is a set of Corsa. Uh, yeah, there's lots of commercial licensing involved and, and, and stuff like that. You know, we chose the Corsa because one, um, it has the most wide range of tracks. So we have all the local tracks, like you know, in LA. Uh, but wherever we go, we can download typically all the tracks that we need to. And if they don't exist, we can have them created for us. Uh, it's, it's an older generation game. It's about 10 years old now. Um, but the physics haven't changed, right? <laughs> So and it's an accessible game. Like you know, if you can drive a car, you can drive to the Corsa, versus some of the other competitors where the learning curve is much deeper, um, which doesn't really work for you know our model and our vision. And like, what kind of uh, like some people will use it to kind of get familiar with the track, and then they'll go and do the real track. Like, what kind of like race tracks do you have? You mentioned ones like in LA. We basically have almost every road course in the world. Um, 
So everything here from Laguna Seca to Daytona to Schleife to Albert Park to you know, Silverstone Spa, you know Bathurst. You know, you know we had Toronto on here, we have Long Beach. So there's very few tracks that we don't have. Do you have like the the 24 hour Le Mans one? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we actually did a uh, one of our first endurance events. We did a two hour endurance, uh, but the computer accelerated the 24 hours. So people during those two hours got to drive throughout the night, in the morning, had to deal with the sun flare, pit stops, all of it. And we did that in the, with a hypercar on Le Mans. It sounds like it would be like an experience to, to do it over that long period of time. Yes. I mean, yeah, people had to like drink water quickly during pit stops. And I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, what's so fun with the motion is that, I mean, your whole body gets shaken the entire time, right? So if you were to play without motion, you would get on the straightaway and you just, nothing really would happen. You just have to wait until you get to your breaking point. But with the motion, I mean, you know, on Le Mans, it's really fun because, you know, it, it's a, a normal road, uh, but yeah, it, it kind of, yeah, I'm not sure how to say it, but like the, the middle of the road is slightly higher than the sides. So you can really feel the car moving side to side and all the bumps and you're just held, holding on for dear life. So it was exhausting. I, I, you know, we had it for two nights. I did one of the nights and I mean, you yeah. know, I, I had to basically be carried to my car. So it's it's kind of like a like hard on your body, like a workout. You kind of have to be a, yeah an athlete to to handle it. I wouldn't go that far, but yes, uh, it, it's definitely a workout. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then nobody would excuse me of being an athlete. <laughs> and then like, well, like the professional drivers, like they do lots of working out and take to to handle those g forces and speeds and stuff, but. You're kind of replicating that, but without, I guess there's not like G forces, but you kind of get pushed back in your seat. You get you get pushed back. You get shaken around a lot. Uh, you know, when you hit the brakes, I mean, the seat moves forward. Yeah, you know, and the wheel. You know, it's one of those things, right? If you hold up a glass of water, it's easy to do it for a minute, but for an hour, it's gonna really be sore. And it's the same with the forces on the wheel. Like you turn it once, no big deal, but you turn it. 2000 times in an hour and you're going to be, you know, quite sore. So it's like yeah, endurance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and it's a really good practice for staying focused as well. Right. Because, you know, things do move very quickly. So the moment you get distracted, you're off the track. Right. And then in terms of when you do crash, like it's kind of a little violent, like it can throw you around. So it's kind of like a, like a, a reward to stay focused because if you do f crash you kind of do get that jolt of like oh this is real it's not just like when a video game on your computer like you're just crashing oh start again on certain tracks you know, if, you know like Rotschleifer for example right so the big track in Germany for people that don't know what it is it's like 150 plus corners uh in about 15 miles or so um you know really punitive curves and if you crash there, you immediately go into the barriers and you'll be crashing for a little while. And it can knock the wind out of you. Uh, it's so realistic that the Apple Watch will register a crash and call the emergency services. So you have to take your watch off, I guess. Yes, yeah, or turn that function <laughs> off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but do people like get kind of scared when they do it or like has people like kind of... No, uh, no uh, yeah. It, it's not that scary. Um, you know, I think people don't know what to expect a lot of the cases. Right? They've never done something like this before unless they're really into racing. So I mean, you know, we get a lot of people here that have never done it before. So they get in and the moment they hit the throttle and they can feel the seat moving and feel the engine vibration, they go, whoa, right? Um, and then often what happens is that they go too fast out of the pit lane and they crash into the pit lane wall. And that's when they realize it's more than a game. So it's kind of like a equivalent to like maybe a, a roller coaster where you're kind of getting thrown around a little bit. Yes. So what kind of people like do the sim racing? Like you mentioned there's professionals, but then there'll also be like young kids and the mums and the dads and like all different types of people have been coming. Yeah, we're really trying to build a community of kind of sim racers. Obviously, I mean, you know, racing is generally attracts a certain demographic, right? So a majority of our clientele that really loves it is between 25 and 45, I'd say, you know, and, and gears more, you know, 
towards male audience. And yeah, I think with, with sim racing, you know, we're getting a lot of people that just really love racing, but for which real racing or like real life racing is just a little you know, out of reach. Um, it's just so expensive, like just the tires, the fuel, and the time investment. Um, and on these rigs, you know, uh, even though the sims, it is real racing, so you still get that same experience, same development of skills. Uh, so a lot of people, when they do it for the first time, uh, they they come back quickly, and you know, we have a lot of people that that come back at least once every couple of weeks, uh, if not every week. And what kind of cars, like, um, if they want to drive, like a mclaren or something like do you have like a different kind of dream car that they could choose yeah we have, we have all type of cars um you know because they are sims uh you know we typically don't recommend the road cars because what happens is that people just hit the throttle right and if you do that in real life you're gonna have a hard time stopping the car as well you know because the hardest part about sim racing is getting used to the speed sensation yeah you know, uh because you don't really have the same speed sensation as you have in real life so you have to train your brain on how to interpret things on the screen. You know, the sound is really important for that. Uh, so if you just do a road car, yeah, typical people have a really hard time braking and turning. Uh, so we recommend to start typically in a Formula 4 car, because has a nice amount of downforce, which makes the turning a little bit easier. Um, GT3 cars are always very popular. Yeah, McLaren GT3, BMW GT3, Porsche GT3. Um, a lot of people want to come in and do Formula One, and we typically advise against that because you know there are real Formula One models, so it, it goes very fast. And one little mistake, and you're in the barriers. You know they're very hard to. Uh, you, know, you get on the throttle, and there's no traction control in Formula One, right? So you just loop around. <laughs> um, yeah, we try to start people off in a Formula 4 car or a GT3, or our favorite is the, the Miatas MX-5. You know, they're great race cars. Um, they're not very fast, but that means you can make mistakes in them, and you'll be all right. Uh, so when it comes to proper racing, you know, when we do a staff race at the end of the night, we typically choose an MX-5. So in terms of like cost, what does it kind of cost to come and do like a race? Yeah, so we have two options right now. Uh, it's either $39 for half an hour or 59 for an hour. And then we have our race nights, which is three hours of racing from 7 till 10, uh, which is 125 And like we talked about, it's kind of exhausting. So you probably don't want to drive for more than a few hours. Yeah, I mean, three hours is really the max. I mean, we, we, we do put some brakes in there. Um, you know, uh, if you're, you know, the hard part is like if you're a good driver, driving two hours is totally fine. Um, if you are a new driver, then an hour is really kind of the max and you need to take a break. Um, you say this, you know, and your brain has to process so much more information than you're used to. So it's just, it's a mental thing more even than a physical thing. Uh, yeah, so like you have, in terms of racing, you have a bunch of people in there competing against each other? Yes, uh, and that's what makes it so much fun. Like if you come by yourself or with two people will try to throw you to get it in the race. Um, if you're with a group of people, you can have your private server. But with the motion that makes it so great is that when you touch each other, you feel it, right? So you're on the straightaway and you're side by side and you just nudge each other, you know, the whole rig will move uh, and the wheel will move and it's just like, you know, uh, you get a lot of shouting <laughs> that way. The people are on headsets, so you can talk to each other. Uh, it makes it, all, yeah. yeah. The racing really makes it a lot of fun. And that's ultimately our goal is to provide people an accessible way to real racing. Cool. And I think you, you chose like the screens rather than having like a headset, like a VR type stuff. Like, what's the, what's the reasoning behind that? A couple of things. Uh, you have to train your body for VR. People get a lot of motion sickness with VR. Uh, you know, so if you come here every day, it's not an issue. But if you come in here for the first time, you know, even if these screens, we experience a little bit of motion sickness sometimes. Uh, but with VR, it would just be through the roof. Uh, secondly, you, know, you constantly have to adjust VR, which is not a problem if you do it at home. But in a commercial setting, you know, for us, uh, unless you get the one with the whole backpack and stuff like that that you have in the VR arcades, uh it doesn't really work well for car driving 
And then lastly, because you have the headset on, you can't see what happens around you. So if you crash and the wheel is still spinning and it's not spinning inside the game, you might accidentally touch the wheel in the wrong place and it could lead to real injury. Right, yeah, so it's like a safety thing as well. Correct. I mean, it, would, it would actually be cheaper for us to do VR rather than the screens. <laughs> uh, the screens are more expensive than a really nice VR headset, uh, but it's just not practical. No, I don't think the technology is quite there yet, but I've seen like the Apple's bringing out that, that one where it's kind of like you can see yourself as well, so like the augmented reality, so you could possibly see the steering wheel as well as like see. So we'll see how that turns out. Give it a few more years. Yeah. <laughs> so is there any like like membership that you offer? Like if you're a member, like you could race as much as you want, no, like if you pay a monthly fee or something like that? Not yet. Uh, yeah, we've been so busy as it is that yeah, the hardest part would be to have Sims available for members and not, you know, shoot ourselves in the foot, you know, financially. Uh, but this is our first location where we're just kind of testing things and seeing if people actually would come and, you know, sim race and come back. There's one thing to get a customer the first time, but do they like it enough that they would actually come back? Uh, which I think we can now answer that yes, that's not a not a problem. So our next location that we're working on is going to be significantly larger, and that will allow us to have the Sims available for memberships. Where are you going to put that location? Have you an idea? Uh, Orange County. Okay. Yeah, I think that's popular place for the car people. Yeah. Yeah, I think it will be a successful successful there. So yeah, yeah, we have about thirteen Sims here. Yeah, we're looking to at least double that in Orange County. Yeah, and the the racetracks, like you said, it's, to go to a racetrack, they're very far away, I think, in terms of traveling. And to have something close to home that's the same kind of experience is kind of will... And especially after this Gran Turismo movie, I think there's going to be a lot of interest. No, I think especially from parents trying to get their kids into racing, you know, the movie, I think, will really help legitimize sim racing. And then you also have like special like race nights and things where you like, is it a Thursday night that you offer? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right now we're doing a Tuesday and Thursdays, you know, when school properly starts, we'll bring it back down to one night a week, but it's from seven till 10, you know, we do three different tracks, typically three different cars, uh, unless it's Formula One, then we do just Formula One that night. And you know, just a little mini championship. You get points for fastest lap, pole position, and then, you know, uh, 10 points for the win, up to one point for sixth place. And at the end of the night, we'll have a podium. I mean, that's a lot of fun. Uh, it just keeps, you know, allows people to experience different cars. You know, we can typically start in a slower car and then build our way up to like a Formula One car or a free car, you know, something formula and fast. So it's just fun to see who's like the best all round racer. Yeah, I think people enjoy like the competition aspect. Like, do you have like, you know, when you go to a arcade, there's a high score, like best lap time or whatever. Do you have that kind of? We, we do a fastest lap competition. Uh, so every week we choose a car and a track and then, you know, uh, we keep track of the fastest lap time with that. What about like the the, the overall, like for the, the history of the? Yeah, because we're so new, we're still working on that. Okay. Uh, yeah, like, and this place itself, yes, yeah, it's, it's a little small, but the next place will have more room to have like proper monitors and those type of things to have all the data available so people can really kind of come in and see how where they stack up. Because it is yeah. a question you often get like, oh, what's the fastest lap on this track in this car? Like, well, I, I don't know every track car combination <laughs> on top of my head. So that that's coming. Like, so the first thing was for us to see would sim racing actually uh, catch on with the masses? And that's been a resounding yes. So now we can kind of build from there. You know, obviously, I expected people would like it, but I didn't expect people would love it this much where I can withdraw out uh, every weekend. That's good, yeah. Because, yeah, like a big scoreboard where it's like the highest, like the fastest lap time, and then that's what people would want to come back and try and beat it. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, the, the other thing that we do is Race Academy. So as I said, yeah, we really want to, make proper racing accessible to people and part of that is education right i mean you come in here for the first time and then you there's a lot more to it than people might expect so we do race academy you know, once or twice a month on wednesday nights we limited to uh, nine students per class right now just because of the space that we have here 
but then we really go over all the, the car physics, racing techniques, racing line, braking skills and stuff like that. People will be you know, driving, we'll then watch their recording, give them tips to go driving again. And typically they lose between five and 10 seconds on the lap time just in one night. Do you have like special like staff, like coaches there that can kind of have history in racing? Yeah, yeah. So myself and um, one of my other uh, colleagues, Bradley, uh, we have coached for the Yamaha Champ School, which is a motor uh, as cast coaches. And then our other uh, colleague, Ryan, has over 10,000 hours in sims and is ridiculously fast. As a team, you know, we, we, we know we have coached a lot uh, in real life and on sims. So we can really help people get to the next level. And in terms of like the Gran Turismo movie, does that happen often or is that going to happen again in the future where they have like a big competition to look for like sim drivers that want to be? No, no, yeah, that, that is happening more and more, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, there's a lot of these competitions. Now, right now, there's a competition in the US uh, that's letting people race online and the winners get to race a radical at Road Atlanta. So I think we're really just seeing the beginning of it. You know, where you know, I think partly due to COVID, you know, sim racing really, you know, had a mass, massive growth spurt. And, you know, you know, with this movie, you know, with Max Verstappen always talking about sim racing, you know, with you know, a couple of NASCAR drivers lately as well, crediting their wins to sim racing, you know, I think it's getting more and more credibility. Um, you know, the Formula One teams are hiring people to just drive in their sims all the time, give them back their data. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, if you're great at sim racing, it translates really well to real life. And you can get so much more experience in sim racing than in real life that, yeah, I would expect that, you know, right now, co-karting is a big initial area for people to learn racing. I think in five to 10 years, that's going to all be sim racing. Yeah, because it's, it's kind of like going to the gym where they'll have, you know, a treadmill or like a weight machine, like that kind of thing. It's like you can go in and get your training done and get out fast. So it's more convenient. Yeah, because I think it's just interesting getting like the whole history of like the sim racing. And like, I think it is, like you said, we're talking about it is the future in terms of technology is only going to get better. And in terms of like ease of use, like instead of having to spend X amount of dollars buying a race car, going to the track, paying all the fees and all that. It's like, it's a lot easier just to go and do it like in a sim. Yeah. Yeah, it really just helps. I mean, if you want to end up on the real track, just being able to go there and learn the braking markers and just knowing where to go, right? And not be surprised. It's a night and day. I mean, it will, it will take you days on the racetrack and thousands of dollars versus, you know, a couple of hours here to get the same results. And I know like a lot of guys who do FPV drones, like they the first person drones, they fly on the simulator for hours and hours to learn it and get used to it so that when they go out into the real life, they don't just crash their drone straight away and have to buy a new one or crash it into somebody like there's that risk. So if you have all that training and knowledge before you go out and do the real thing, it's only going to be beneficial. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Donovan. Thanks, Rory. Nice no to meet you. All right. See you later. Bye-bye. Thank you.